Okay, hello YouTube. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I don't know if you even know my name is Marina. Um, and I wanted to do my walk away part two. Um, if you haven't seen my walk away part one, which was recorded, I think over four years ago, um, please check that out. Uh, one of the things, a couple of the things that I talk about in my walk away was how for many years, I didn't really get personally involved in things that, you know, like social services or, you know, just kind of helping out in my community because I figured that people who were good at that stuff, who knew how to do that stuff, had it covered. Um, and it wasn't until I left the corporate world and kind of started paying more attention to things that I might be able to do that I realized that it wasn't exactly covered. Um, and so at the end of my video, I recommended to people that instead of trying to outsource their compassion and their concern for their community to politicians who absolutely do not care for their communities in many, many cases, far too many for us to trust the few that do care about it to handle some of these problems, that we should roll up our sleeves and we should get to work and start doing things within our own community that, um, that will make our community better and just take ownership of it. The more we take ownership of it, the easier it will be to get rid of those people who are either career politicians or people who are actually trying to um, sort of leech off of the people in their um, districts, in their communities to, for, their, for their own good. So what is it that I have been doing? Um, I promised that I would talk about the volunteer work that I do, and I am going to talk about that now because this was my first roll up your sleeves moment. I had a case a while ago, and I, I don't know if I still have any of these videos up talking about what happened in a case that I took on on my own against City Mortgage. This was when I first learned the degree and extent of corruption in the courts. So from that point, after years, I believe that case started in 2012. And after years of fighting and seeing, you know, when you first start out litigating a case on your own, if you haven't done that before, you have a lot to learn. It's a very steep learning curve. And so things that they may be able to get away with early on because you just don't know, little procedural things that you might miss, um, these things will kind of go over your head but as time goes on you start to realize there are inconsistencies you fix one problem and then there's another one it's kind of like that whack-a-mole um, that uh, vice presidential candidate jd vance was talking about you fix one thing that they tell you um you know you didn't do right and then there's something else and over time as you sit in court because a lot of you may not know when you have a court hearing in a civil case a lot of times you will have multiple hearings in that case and oftentimes you'll get to sit through other people's hearings while you're waiting for your case to be called. The court may have 20 hearings scheduled on a particular morning and you may be 10. So that means that you get to hear one through nine. And that's my, that was my first indication that something was wrong. Because I would hear the judge, you know, litigating one case and she would roll a certain way and I'd be like, oh, okay, so I'm in a really good position on that. Um, and then it, my case would come along and it would be denied or there'd be something wrong. Now, every case is different, so you can't always know for sure, but what I started doing is I started researching these other cases to figure out, like, well, what are they doing that I'm not doing? And I would go, actually go to the, the clerk's office in that courthouse, and I would go look up those cases, and I would read them, and I found, the first thing that I found was that a lot of the uh, pleadings that were written by attorneys were not, they weren't better than mine. The reality is when I write pleadings for a case that I'm litigating, I just take what some other lawyer wrote that is close to what I'm trying to argue and then I just put in my own story, my own arguments based on what's going on in my case. So there's rarely going to be a case where my, my particular pleading that I submitted to the court is worse than what attorneys are submitting. So over time with that case, I continued to run into one corrupt obstacle after another. And I won't go into details about that right now, although I have gone into detail about it. And maybe I'll put some of those videos in the links below so you can take a look at them. Um, but it, it prompted me to start just kind of reaching out to other people who were self-represented to see if they needed help or just a sympathetic ear. Because after a while, I started to think that I was crazy. 
you know, you go in, you know you read one thing, you're watching other people with similar arguments, they're being able to prevail on their arguments, that's the law, but then it comes to your case and it's like something totally different. So I started to reach out to other people to see what their experience was. It was really just a matter of moral support because again, I was starting to lose it. I'm like, well, what, what am I doing wrong? And as I started to talk to other people, um, I found that there was, this was something that I could do to help. Um, whether it's moral support, whether it's just sharing pleadings, sharing strategies that we both had used and they were representing themselves in one case and I would represent, you know, I was representing myself in another case. At a certain point, my case was over, but I would continue to reach out to people just based on seeing them on a docket or seeing them posting something on the internet. And I probably started doing that around 2017, 2016, 2017. And after I did that a couple of times, people started calling me. I would get people referred to me. Sometimes they would have maybe had a lawyer at some point, but then they lost their lawyer. Other times they were having difficulty finding a lawyer. And so I would try to help fill in the blanks or fill in the gaps anywhere that I could. And I just continued to get more and more referrals, more and more referrals. But over time, I really didn't trust having, you know, I would just recommend to people, if you can find a lawyer, if you can afford a lawyer, then definitely do so because they treat you differently if you have a lawyer there there's a very disres, there's a lot of disrespect amongst self-represented litigants in the civil courts it's almost like they feel like you should not have the audacity to come in and actually try to do this but very few people want to do this people don't want to litigate a case on their own without the assistance of an attorney and I'll go into all the issues. I, I think I've already started going into some of the issues that people have with attorneys, but this is something that people do because they have no other choice. So I just found that I was able to be a good source of moral support to people. And some of the cases that I have worked on with people, both with their lawyers or on their own have been absolutely horrific. I'm gonna do an entire separate video about a man that I worked with. His name was William Palmer. His house was stolen through the probate court in Los Angeles Superior Court. And when I say his house was stolen, like I'm not, I'm not being hyperbolic. He inherited a house from his father. When his father died, he was the only son of his, of his father. And so under the law, he's entitled to that property. And he did live there. Well, his half sister, who was not his father's daughter, went to probate court, lied, said she was his daughter she entire fabricated an entire family of fake heirs forged documents put them before the court and the court gave her administrator rights over his father's estate not her father's estate his father's estate she sold the house and the next thing he knows someone is knocking on his door saying they're the new owner of the house the court would not reverse that sell and they did not have, you know, she finally, the, the house sister finally did actually admit that she had lied to the court. They didn't care. And this is an actual case. And he had a lawyer. I, I will always be grateful to the lawyer who worked on the William Palmer case. I told him, as long as you are working on this case, I will do whatever you need me to do. And we worked together for over a year. And I think we worked together very well. And I appreciate what he did because he did not get paid for this case. And he put in probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of work on this case and I think at a certain point he was able to see that it didn't matter what actually happened the court didn't care and so I could not blame him at all for stepping back from this case um, this was the first time I saw this happen to someone who was represented and I was actually kind of taken aback because I had seen this happen to people who were self-represented but I had never seen this happen to anyone who was um, who had an attorney and a very competent attorney, this very skilled attorney. I'm not gonna say his name. Um, however, it is a public record. So anybody who wants to look for that, they will be able to go out there and find it. Um, but from that point forward, you know, again, I continue to get more referrals from people. I would try to help people find attorneys um, because I was just trying to stop them from getting completely run over by the court. Um, 
but I continued to see that there were certain things I don't you know some people say they're being paid off I don't know whether they're being paid off or not I don't know whether the judges are being paid off but I do know one thing when they're ruling and not following the law they know what they're doing because I've sat through enough of their courtroom hearings um, to know that they're they're not following the law and they know this so this is something that they're doing intentionally um, and I've seen it time and time again I don't know how widespread it is exactly um, I most attorneys don't want to talk about this but this was the way in which I rolled up my sleeves and I w worked very much behind the scenes the state bar started to stalk me after attorneys that were on the other side of cases I w was working on whether there were attorneys or not started to report me to the bar for practicing law without a license now I have never asked for a penny for the work that I do. I've never accepted a penny for the work that I do. I'm just being a good neighbor. But I got letters from the bar telling me to cease and desist helping people. If I needed any more proof that the establishment that exists currently is not actually trying to help people and what they're trying to do is take power and control for themselves, this was it. I, I sent one um, communication to the bar after they first approached me saying that they thought I was practicing law without a license. And the reason, I, I was absolutely livid. It's not easy to make me angry. I was livid because I reported an attorney to the bar that I had paid $1,500 so that um, she could appear in court for someone else that I was trying to help. I didn't want, I, you know, I said, I don't recommend you go to court without a lawyer, you know, and I put my own money up. I paid $1,500, she did not show up to court, and I reported her to the bar. And she reported me to the bar in retaliation. And I'm not kidding, I just want a lawsuit against her and I will make a separate video about that because I think this woman's mentally unstable. She's been sending me threatening and harassing emails and text messages, it's absolutely bizarre. Um, and so I told the bar, I was like, what do you expect people to do? What I normally do if I'm trying to help someone find an attorney is I will review their case, whatever you know, case records exist, and then I can kind of summarize it for the attorney um, so that they, you know, because before an attorney decides to take a case, especially if there's, you know, if you have to figure out how much money to ask for, if the person doesn't have a lot of money, um, things like that, then you really need to be able to figure out whether or not it's a case that you can take or not without spending a lot of time on it. So I will do that for them and then I'll present the case to them and say, is this a case that you can take on? And I will offer my own services to that attorney because I am, if nothing else, I make a very, very competent paralegal and I've worked with several attorneys at this point in that capacity where my service is being offered to the person that I'm trying to help so that the attorney can give them a discount. And if there's paperwork that they need done, things that are very labor intensive that I know how to do, then I will work on that for them. And so this is this became how I rolled up my sleeves. And it the more I got into this, the more work I took on, the more cases I worked on, the more corruption I saw. Um, you know, one time I tried to work on someone in a criminal case, he had a public defender. And his public defense, I don't know if she was lazy or if she was just part of the establishment because my experience with pers public defenders, unfortunately, um, they're mostly competent attorneys. You know, I don't necessarily think that a private attorney, a c criminal defense attorney is better than a public defender, but public defenders are solely and 100% invested in getting you to take a plea deal. They are not trying to go to trial to defend a client in most cases, even when they're not guilty they're more likely to want to take a, a case to trial for a person that they know is guilty or suspect is guilty, but they want to try to make some kind of a point, maybe make a name for themselves if they think it will be high profile. I find that very unfortunate. And by the way, if there's any criminal defense attorneys out there who would like to challenge me on that or back me up on that, um, maybe a criminal defense attorney or former criminal defense attorney, I know it's a small channel, but I am happy to have that conversation with you, have you on, talk to you privately and protect your um, anonymity while I try to provide information to the public about what's going on. I definitely feel like that's something that people need to be aware of. Um, so this was how I rolled up my sleeves. 
I do believe that I am making a difference in helping people with these kinds of cases. Uh, an attorney who's a solo practitioner out there, you know, sometimes I have more than I can handle taking on, but I'm trying to figure out how I can expand my reach. And one of the reasons I decided to get back into doing my YouTube channel was because I thought that was a way for me to have a little bit of extra money to put towards the work that I'm doing. Um, going to court is not free. Winning, winning in court is not free. If you are in a, the middle of a big civil case and you need discovery, if you need to take people's depositions, that, that costs a lot of money. And I have many times paid for that out of my own pocket um, so that people could keep their cases alive um, when their attorney, you know, their attorney maybe is not going to be able to put out that kind of money. Um, and I want to be able to continue to do that. I want to be able to give people a fighting chance. In most cases, in a civil case, your fighting chance comes from making people feel like maybe this is a case that they should settle um, in a more favorable term than they would have otherwise. You should settle your cases if at all possible. Sometimes you have a point to make and you don't want to settle your case, but just understand that that's probably not a case that an attorney is going to want to take because this is their livelihood. This is what they do for a living. And so they cannot afford to take on a ton of cases where they're doing it to just make a point. Um, and it, it does happen, but it's not very common and it's not something that I would say that people should expect. So over time, I really narrowed down my rolling up my sleeves to helping people in difficult legal situations. One of the things that has really grown for me um, in terms of people that I get calls about is probate. Um, there is, I don't even know really how to describe what's going on in particularly LA County where I live in probate courts where they're, because of the way our property tax system works, they want desperately for any house to be sold but in many cases, selling a property that, you know, has been in your family since the 1960s or the 1970s, that taxes are less than $1,000 a year oftentimes, um, selling that house, taking your cash, and then trying to make that as, as valuable of an asset as it would have been to keep the house is not, I wouldn't recommend it. There are so many families who cannot get along um, and so they can't come to any kind of agreement to keep the house. They end up selling it. They take their money. For most people, in a couple of years or less, that money is gone. Um, and so is the property. So I try to encourage people to do that. But even doing that, it's up against a system that doesn't want you to keep your property. And so if there's one person in the family that's just sort of out there, you know, they want to sell the house, they don't want anybody else to have the house. If you're that person, stop, okay? If you're that person, stop that. Um, then the court will almost side with that person, just knowing that as long as the family continues to fight, that they will never be able to keep the property. And, you know, for example, sometimes you'll have one family member that wants to buy out the other family members, um, things like that. And the court is never gonna, well, I don't wanna say never, they do have mediations and things like that. But if it comes down to it, it seems like they will always side with the person who's trying to get the house sold. And it's almost like that's just their unspoken, unwritten policy. Um, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's been my experience. I, the, the person that William Palmer, who had his house stolen, the man that worked with his half sister to help her steal the house has done this and at least a dozen other cases. Five of them were litigated, meaning that there were other lawyers that were working on cases where the house was stolen or there was some other type of exploitation to get his hands on these properties. And the County of Los Angeles will not arrest this man. It's, it's documented, it's now official court record. It's been investigated by LA Superior Court investigators and even the investigation was a cover-up because any person with any kind of sense can see that what this man is doing is criminal. He's stealing houses and he's using his phone number and other people's names and signing proofs of service while he's holding deeds that have yet to be recorded for the property that he already paid money for. It's insane what he's doing and that's all a part of the court record and they will not arrest this man. So as far as I'm concerned, they are complicit in that, um, meaning the courts are complicit, like maybe conspiring with LA County 
to make sure that no sale is ever reversed that if, if you know some of these houses they would just stay at that low tax base and the family member that inherited it would continue to pay those taxes but they don't want that they want the house sold so if they have someone who's an absolute criminal that's going around facilitating the sale of these houses they're willing to let that happen um and I don't have any doubt that they know that it's happening at this point. So I'm calling this my walk away point part two. This is how I decided to roll up my sleeve. But over time, I'm seeing that there are a lot of problems in my area and I in the world. Yes, in the country. Yes, but I see a lot of problems in my area and they're not getting fixed. And I'm going to be putting out some ideas for how they can be fixed and sort of a call to action. I think I know how to fix the homeless problem. Now, maybe I'm wrong but we'll see. I'm gonna make a video about that. I believe that that problem has to be fixed from the bottom up, not the top down. My, I did an assessment of um, the homeless problem and what type of housing assistance is available in 2018. And I believe, I'm just putting this out there, that there are actually more people who are working in the homeless services in this, the county of Los Angeles than the actual number of people who are homeless. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. If anyone has exact numbers on that, let me know. But I'm not talking about people who are volunteers. I'm talking about people who are paid to work in homeless services. There's more of them than there are homeless people. So something is not right. We continue to put more and more money towards the homeless problem, but we have more and more homeless people. On my next video, hopefully my next video or in my next couple of videos, I'm going to tell you how you can start to fix the homeless problem. I have people in my family who suffer from mental illness. I have one that spent a great deal of time homeless and I have one, two, that spent virtually no time homeless because I figured out that it has to start right there. And trust me, I know, you cannot just let a drug addict or a mentally ill person live in your home. They will rob you blind. They will sometimes terrorize you. They will disturb your peace. But there are other ways, and I'm going to tell you guys how you can do that. And I think, you know, there's there's a lot of people on YouTube who are talking about problems. There's not a lot of people who are giving concrete solutions, concrete calls to action, things that you can do. There are some, and I'm going to name them right here at the end of my video and give tribute to people like Scott Pressler, people like Brandon Strzok, People like that who have mobilized a huge contingent of people um, in their own communities. Um, Scott Pressler, uh, he's one of the people that I most respect. What he did with going up and putting some of these governments to shame that can't manage to keep their cities clean. If you don't know Scott P Pressler, I believe he goes under the persistence on Twitter. If you don't know him, um, if you're not following him, I, I, I greatly suggest that you find out what he did because he's also registering people to vote. I believe he's based in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure what area, um, but he, he mobilized a great number of people to get registered to vote. And he also just went from city to city, brought together people in that neighborhood to clean up. And some of them have continued to do it. It's a beautiful thing as far as I'm concerned. Scott Pressler, I salute you for what you've done. Hopefully you'll see this video one day. And um, so everyone, they're not going to fix these problems for us. They they don't exist. They are not relevant. I'm talking about the political class. Um, if we fix the problems that they have refused to fix. And once we take control of the problems, we can take control of the solutions and then we can take control of them. Okay. Uh, thanks for watching the video and I will see you in the next one. Please get the comments, um, put your comments down, like the video, share the video. If you like this kind of content, subscribe to my channel and I will see you on the next one.